I've always been fascinated by this circuit. The massive run through the forest is what I look back on as such an icon of speed in Formula 1. But that forest section that I love so much, for some reason, was what kind of caused the demise of this former track. The Hockenheim Ring has a history and some of its old sections sit abandoned in a forest to this day. So what exactly happened? On the 29th of May 1932, the Dreieckskurs, translated to Triangle Course, was officially opened, designed by a timekeeper named Ernest Christ, who simply wanted a racetrack in his hometown of Hockenheim, so he went ahead and designed one. The first layout was named Triangle Course for a reason, simply because of its triangular shape. Six mostly sharp corners feature in the layout with some long straights, not the type of layout we're used to these days. The layout was used from 19 1932 until 1938, where the first major modifications would take place. By 1938, the circuit had changed quite a bit and was much less triangle shaped. The circuit was shortened from 12 kilometers down to just over 7.5. One of the big changes was the inclusion of the Oss curve, which saw a long run into the forest, swinging back around and rejoining the original triangle hairpin. The triangle course was no more, and the circuit had a new name. During World War II, the circuit would take some damage, and after after the repairs, the circuit would be renamed once again, this time to the Hockenheim Ring. The track would eventually start seeing some real success, with MotoGP races taking place at the Hockenheim Ring, while alternating with other circuits. 1965 would see the Hockenheim Ring change once again, with the stadium section being added, and then, after the tragic death of racing legend Jim Clark in 1968, two chicanes were added and barriers. In 1982, another chicane was added to the Oscurve section. The first chicane Cane would also be made slower. Slight adjustments would take place throughout the years, and the forest section now featured three chicanes, Clark, Ost, and Senna. Why did this circuit get exposed so badly as the years went on, and why was it Formula One that would force the Hockenheim Ring to change once again? The circuit's character was extremely difficult, not exactly from a driving sense, but more on the setup side of the car. Do you opt for low downforce, or the opposite, in order to make up time in the stadium section? The track length was quite something as well, meaning you'd be looking at a 45 lap race. Majority of the grandstands were situated in the stadium section, which meant very limited viewing. The run into the forest was almost isolated from everything else. During the mid 80s turbo era, new fuel restrictions had been introduced, which limited the amount of fuel allowed during a race. Drivers would sometimes run out of fuel, including Formula One legend Alain Prost, who would run out of fuel at the end of the 1986 race, pushing his car to the finish line before giving up altogether. The year 2000 was when the Hockenheim Rings layout was again put under the spotlight, and more questions were asked change was almost certainly on the way. In 2000, Rubens Barrichello would start from 18th, but would go on to win, claiming his first ever Formula 1 win, which has gone down as one of the more emotional moments in Barrichello's career. Most of the overtakes throughout that race would happen deep in the forest, meaning not a whole lot of spectators were witness to the action. The weather was changeable as well, with rain in the stadium section and nearly completely dry in the forest section. About halfway through the race, an unhappy Mercedes employee, who had recently lost his job, decided to walk onto the track in what was a public display of the circuit's near non-existent security measures. In the forest section, Alesi and Denise would collide, sending Alesi into a spin and causing him dizziness for the following three days. 2000 was really all the evidence needed to show that things need to change at Hockenheim once again. Spectator viewing, safety and security were all brought into question. Martin Brundle would also say during the broadcast of the 2002 German Grand Prix that he and many other drivers of that era didn't like racing at Hockenheim. There was a time where you were lucky to finish this race. You either ran out of fuel, suffered a failure because of the long straights, or crashed. In the early 2000s, F1 were pushing for change in Hockenheim and threatened to race elsewhere if something wasn't done. The state government secured money and Hermann Tilke had the task of redesigning the Hockenheim ring for 2002. A lot of the old Hockenheim forest section was torn up and trees were planted so nobody could race in that ice isolated forest ever again. Still today, fans and drivers miss the old Hockenheim Ring layouts, with icons such as one Pablo Montoya 
Yano Trulli and Ron Dennis criticising the new layout and much preferring the old one. The old Hockenheim ring will always be one of Formula 1's most iconic circuits, and not just because of the old layout, but because in 1970, drivers decided to boycott the Nürburgring unless changes were made, meaning the first ever time that Hockenheim hosted the German Grand Prix was due to a safety boycott. I find it somewhat ironic that the reason this track not only got a Grand Prix, but also turned into an abandoned piece of history was due to safety concerns. Hockenheim hasn't had such a steady relationship with Formula 1 in recent years. In 2006, it was announced that starting from 2007 until 2010, Formula 1 in Germany would be shared between the Nürburgring and the Hockenheim Ring. It was, in some ways, the best of both worlds. When 2010 came around, the race was set to go ahead at the Hockenheim Ring as per the agreement, though there was a potential problem which put the whole race in jeopardy. The track owners and city weren't prepared to pump more money into the event, but a last minute deal was struck in September 2009, which would see the Hockenheim Ring stay on the Formula 1 calendar until 2018. F1 in Germany would still be shared between the Nürburgring until 2013, but the Nürburgring would be under new ownership in 2014. A deal was unable to be made to continue with the alternating arrangements, and the future of Formula 1 ever going back to the circuits was doubtful. The Hockenheim Ring still stuck to holding the race every second year, so in 2015 and 2017, Germany would be absent from the Formula 1 calendar. Formula 1 in Germany would be in doubt altogether after 2018, as the contract was set to end, but another year was added in 2019, and we got one of the most entertaining and best races of the year. There was no deal for the Hockenheim Ring in 2020, but due to the cancellation of many races that year, the Nürburgring made its return to the Formula 1 calendar, and was a great moment. But why didn't the Hockenheim Ring make its way back on the calendar for 2021 and beyond. It all comes down to money. When Michael Schumacher dominated the sport, Germany's eyes were on the racing phenomenon. Sponsors wanted to get involved in the event, a huge broadcasting deal was struck, and it was just a big deal. According to Forbes, in 2006, 232,000 people attended the event over the course of the weekend. Fast forward to 2014, attendance fell to just 94,000 a huge decrease from its prime years. A potential Hockenheim return has been discussed numerous times, though there has been no solid plan or news that it will be returning anytime soon. Hockenheim is missed by many F1 fans. The old layout will never be forgotten, even though it has become overgrown forest. When the sun goes down and day turns into night, the one thing that remains in the forests of the Hockenheim ring is the screaming engines from past eras of Formula 1. One. Thank you for watching this video. Some of you may notice that this is a remake. Obviously, I look back at some of my old content sometimes, and I do cringe a little bit, and I feel like videos on topics like this deserve a bit of a remastering, so I hope you enjoyed it. We're so close to 100,000 subscribers, so I would really appreciate it if you could help me out by hitting the subscribe button. If you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it if you hit the like button. Feel free to follow me on Instagram for some behind the scenes content and future video sneak peeks. As always, I truly appreciate your support, and I will see you in the next one.